Let us begin. In this text right here, starting in verse 17, it's talking about Elijah. When Elijah meets Ahab, challenges the prophets of Baal. Baalism was a, and this Baalism is still going on now, to tell you the truth. But Baal is probably one of the worst ones because it ties in with a lot of sex and a lot of money. Fertility gods and all they got different, they had different gods back in the game. And uh, by name, we got them still now, but they just covered up under different kind of names like uh, Louis Vuitton or, 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 or uh, 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 clothing fashions or types of automobiles, things that show prestige that could, that could take us socially uh, make us think socially that we're above somebody else because they might be wearing Kmart, you know. So the names are very important. And that's why Jesus said, at the name of Jesus, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess because everybody, even the demons, got to bow down to Jesus because it's about the name. It's very important about the names that we have and the names that, and because names represent labels. And then somebody can label you as something that didn't happen to you. And guess what? You live by that negative experience about what happened to you. And you label yourself and make a name for it. Some of us in here probably had nicknames out in the world that we dad don't even want to talk about in church. <laughs> we know what Bugsy means. We know what Poke Chop means. <laughs> but now we say, we're like, no, nah, I don't want to be dealing with that name no more because that name... It's played out. I'm too over that name. I don't do that kind of stuff no more because my name has changed. And the name didn't change, the game didn't change, and my outlook and my victory in life has changed. And that's what Elijah did. He came in here and made a change right here. It says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, and Ahab said unto him, Art thou he troubled, that troubled he that troubled Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. But thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baalim. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of Groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel. That old harlot, Jezebel. That's still trying to affect the church. Jezebel. Jezebel represents rebellion. That's where that bell come at. And bell, that God bell, it represents rebellion. She represents a rebellion, rebellious spirits. Anytime, it's not just about, uh, 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 witchcraft is not just about having a cornetta <laughs> or somebody putting a prick in your hair out and then, in the Bible, it speaks of witchcraft as just being rebellious. Ah, so that's that, ain't that right there. That's, in the Bible, and also it says in the Word that the rebelliousness is as the sin of witchcraft and that stubbornness <laughs> is as the sin of idolatry. You be like, well, I don't worship no idols. I don't go around worshiping idols. I'm not worshiping this stand or my car. But the thing is, how stubborn am I? Because <laughs> stubbornness in the scripture is as the sin of iniquity, idolatry. Because stubbornness has set me above God's standard. See, some of, us, we, some of us, we have operated these things. And thank God for the blood of Jesus to cover us through a lot of this, because a lot of us, the Bible says my, my, my children, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's not that you really a real sinful person out there, because the, the most simplest person out there is the most ignorant, might be the most ignorant person out there. Ignorant meaning, the, uh, the definition of ignorant, it means not knowing. They ain't been to church, they weren't raised up in the church, but they're ignorant, so it's not knowing. And not having this earth, this knowledge, this spiritual knowledge of this food in you to be able to combat that God, that ungodly system that floats through my mind and makes me want to rebel all the time. Hallelujah. And that's why when we come to church, we come to church to get fed because we know that we got a rebellion inside of us that's always trying to get us, as Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 7, where he said about uh, 
You know, with, I, I'm fighting this flesh. She said, I, when I want to do good, <laughs> evil is always present with me. You know, those things that I hate to do, I do. Paul said, you know, so Paul is saying, I'm talking about the personal struggle that go on in my life. And so the thing is that he's saved and spreading the gospel all over Asia Minor and still telling you, I still got a conflict and a battle within me. Oh, my God. My will wants to do something totally different from what God wants it to do. So right here. Back to the text, it said, So Ahab said unto the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together under Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? I shared that scripture last night up there in Midland. How long will you halt between two opinions? He said, If the Lord God be God, follow him. <laughs> and the people answered him, Not a word. He said, but if Baal, then follow him. God said, you can't walk nowhere with, with two, one foot in, one foot out. Because then you hanging, on, you hanging on to God for conscience sake and not growth and not responsibility and not wanting to be more like him. Because what, I got one foot in here and I got one foot out. So guess what? I can change up my view and be like, well, I'm good here. Sunday, I go to church for conscience sake. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I act a fool for this sake. And, uh, he said, how long will you halt between two opinions? And, get my deal right there, my pad. The definition to the word halt, I looked that definition up yesterday before I left. Holy Spirit put it on my mind just before I got on the road to look it up. And I said, okay, I'm going to look this definition up. Thank you, babe. In the Hebrew, that word means <laughs> to hop, to skip over, or spare, by implication, to hesitate. Also, to limp, to dance, become lame, leap, pass over. Wow. And when I looked at dance, I'm like, wait a minute, so you telling me that I can be dancing for you, Jesus, dancing, and still be at a halt in my spirit? Yeah. You mean I could be doing some things of you, God, and still be in halt? Yes. It says right here, he said, to skip over. He said, how long will you halt between two opinions? So mainly what he was saying was, you need to make up your mind. And so really right here, before all this that happened, before all this, I'm going to read Gwyneth, he was really giving them a chance. Come over here with me or stay right there. Because the Bible says about being hot, he said, I read the book of uh, Revelation, he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. He said, because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out your mouth, out my mouth. And the word spew means vomit you out of my mouth. That's why God looks at people that's lukewarm, halfway here, halfway there, half-hearted. It makes them want to throw up. Wow. Now, remember, this word of God is written to his people because the people in the world don't understand this. So he's talking about us. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine God's stomach turning when he look at you? He still loves you, but you still make him sick. Anybody, y'all probably got kids. I, I love you, but man, today you're making me sick. Some of the decisions you're making, <laughs> some of the decisions you're making, making me sick. And plus, the thing that's making me sick is not you. It's that you know better. You was raised better. You come to church. Pastor priest, you prayed over you. So you know better. So how long will you halt between two opinions? Just because you're making me sick don't mean I don't love you. But I am letting you know you're making me sick. And if you love me, don't make me sick. God is like, I just want to just obey and do what I say. And it will be well with us. Hallelujah. Everybody in here probably got kids and grandkids. This is a whole different type of generation that we're in right now. And this struggle right here is going on today. But what I like about this struggle when I get through reading is that we still win in the end. Amen. <laughs> it says right here, it says, 
Come on down, it says, and Elijah came unto the people. No, no, 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450. Here I am, one, going against 450 other people. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, and but no put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of the of your gods, <laughs> and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answered by fire, let him be God. Amen. So God is saying, He has trust. Not only in his life, but he's saying, I trust God is going to manifest himself. And my life is on the line that he manifests himself today. And that's the kind of attitude we got to have, is that our lives have to be on the line to trust that God is going to manifest himself. And the word manifest means to reveal, be made known. <laughs> I was telling my daughter when I was getting out the car a while ago, I said, I said, I say God is God wants us to communicate and go deeper in a deeper relationship with Him and talk to Him. I say sometimes we share some of the uttermost feelings with the very first very person that's gonna betray us, and we talk to our friends at work or at home or area, what we talk to them way more hours in the day than our little ten or fifteen minutes with God. God wants that same type of communication as well. He is a person. But guess what? Society will get us to the point that they he's Santa Claus. We just gonna come to him with a request and we're gonna leave. No, God is a human. He came in human flesh. So that means he wants communication too. Don't know human. If you ever been to the nursing home, I've done another nursing home ministry. Man, when you come through that door, if any of y'all been in one, what kind of response when you walk through that day? How they want you to talk to them right. They want to communicate. They want to say, how you doing, baby? They might not even know you. They might have Alzheimer's, don't even know you, and still want, baby, I don't know you, but can you come over here? And the thing is, and, and, but 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 they won't touch, they won't ability. And Jesus came in and he wants that same thing. To talk to him. Lay all your burdens down. Give him to give him all your troubles to Jesus. Communicate with him. He's not dead. He's alive. He's not on the cross no more. He's sitting on the throne right next to the Father in the book of Acts, he said. He's sitting right there waiting on us to talk to him. Tell him, tell him all about our struggles. He know he's been there. That's why he's considered our high priest is because he's been there. He's been through the next trouble that you've been to go through. He's been there. <laughs> he's been through the, the trouble that you came out of. He's been there. He going even the next trouble that you, even your kids might go through. He's been there. You might as well talk to somebody that's been there. <laughs> My God. Because it, it builds up our confidence. I'm talking to somebody with some experience that has been there. What I look like telling somebody that don't even know my business and don't even know me, don't even care about me. What I look like telling them, they gonna look at me like, mm hmm? <laughs> Cause they don't even know what I'm talking about. But Jesus understands all our troubles. Man, it is so such a privilege, y'all, to be saved. It's such an honor to know that we going to heaven after all this. The, the, the room going to light up gold, y'all. And we going up that ladder. And we going to be in the Father, in the, the thing we've been coming to church preaching about all these years and all this we've been talking about this Jesus and all this we ain't never seen him and singing about him. One day we going to meet that man. <laughs> we are going to see Jesus and all his splendor and all his glory we got a we we got a glimpse, we got a preview of what he looked like on the Mount of Transfiguration. Clothes so white, nice, every peace, tranquility. It's in us. Heaven has got to be in you in order to get to heaven, y'all. That's right. <laughs> because Jesus is heaven. Jesus is the church. 
And right here it said, and call you on the name of the God said, and Elijah said, said verse 25, and Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourself, dress it first, no, 26. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal. From morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped on the altar which, <laughs> which was made. I said, you all come down here. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. <laughs> Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey. Or prayer adventure, he might be sleeping. Maybe you want to wake your God up from a nap <laughs> and must be awakened. Elijah got 400 prophets, 450 people that's against him, don't like him. That's like us being in the middle of 450 extremists <laughs> with guns and sitting over at Tottenham saying, where is your God, ISIS? What's going on? I know you got that big pistol. This is boldness right here. But because he stood and knew his God, ain't no way anybody in their right mind gonna sit up with one person versus 450,000, 450 people that don't like you with no confidence in your God. <laughs> you gotta have a confidence that make you look as crazy as a dog running around chasing his own tail. <laughs> you got to have a, a boldness like a lion. And so it said, and they cried aloud and cut themselves. This is where that come from, the cutting, these teenagers cutting themselves, veil worship. He bail worshipers. God is not going to tell you to self-mutilate yourself because in the word he said that him that destroys the temple of God, him shall God destroy. So God is not going to tell you to be cutting on yourself and hurting yourself and mutilating yourself. I don't care if them kids tell you what it make, you, make me feel better, it gives me a release. No, it don't. It's adding more pain. Mm -hmm. Or you wouldn't be having to keep cutting yourself. Right. My God, thank you, Jesus. It says... Till blood gushed out upon them. Wow. They ain't Jesus. They blood wasn't going to save nobody. But that deceptive spirit was telling them that blood would help. My God. It said, it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> they must have done it in the morning. Because in verse 27, it says, it was past noon. <laughs> and this verse right here starts out in verse 30, for 29, it says, it's the evening sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. But it was there all day. This wasn't just no uh, one hour thing, because I think it take more than an hour to cut up a whole bull. <laughs> I mean, I've seen folks skiing deers, and it take a while. So imagine them cutting up a whole bull. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> yeah. And so it says right here. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He said, Elijah said, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> unto all the people. Come near unto me. Come here. Come here, guys. Come here. Come on, you too. You too, little kid old y'all. Come to me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. Ooh, that was the first thing he did was he repaired the altar. Before the manifested things of God came into this person's life, and Elijah even signifies the prophetic in us, there might be that some stuff in the altar of our heart needs to be repaired. So that God can come in and show up and show out again. He said, I'm waiting to show up on your behalf. But are you prepared? and repair and allowing me to repair your spirit repair where you got hurt repair the depression repair uh, what people let you down repair the betrayal that happened to you repair 
what the family have done to you. Are you ready? Are you ready for that altar to be repaired? Because if you just let me come in there and repair, don't think that man, I'm too old to get a repair. No, it ain't. No, you're not. I'm God saying this today. Anytime you hear the word, his word is for now. He don't dwell on age and time. He is eternity to come steps and interrupts time. Jesus is the greatest interrupter of time. Because he's eternity to step into time. He's the greatest interrupter of time. And any time Jesus come in and interrupt the eternity of Jesus Christ to come in and interrupt your time, it's because he has something great in store for you. And he has great works and great stuff to be done. So don't worry. Always allow Jesus to come in and interrupt our time. What's that old song? Time in a bottle. <laughs> That's all we are. <laughs> and we get Jesus to step in the middle of it, man. He straightens up. He makes things all well and straighten up things. And I don't care what some of your family members might be going through. He can make that well. Look at you. Y'all probably had haters out there say, I know he ain't finna go to church. I've been trying to get him to church. How long? <laughs> now look at him singing on the <laughs> and playing the <laughs> instruments. Amen. Some of y'all were so bad out there. Some of them bar owners probably said, I'm glad he got saved. I'm tired of him tearing up my bar. Fighting in here every weekend. Pool balls getting swung from this start of the, the joint to the next. <laughs> Sweeping up glass from them acting fool. <laughs> That's crazy when the Bible and the devil glad you got saved. Man, you messing up my stuff on somewhere. <laughs> okay, right here it says, and Elijah took 12 stones. Number 12 signifies government. 12, load 12. About 12 is the 12 sons of Israel. New, 12 tribes of Israel, all new government. And all his sons that came, came from those tribes, they named them out for them. So it's 12 is government. That's awesome. So God, he, he's established a new government, a covenant. And right here he says, uh, and that's what God wants to do with us, that the government, his government can be upon our shoulders, up in this mindset. We can have his government, his rule, his kingdom rulership, right up here in this cabeza up here. <laughs> And then it says, And Elijah took twelve stones according to, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. Look at that, y'all. Order. God is a God of order. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let all things be done in decency and in order. God was putting this thing back in order, repair, and now order. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice. So he said, I'm so confident, I'm going to pour water on all this wood. Now, I don't know about y'all. Have any of y'all barbecued before? <laughs> now, have y'all ever poured water on the wood before y'all started? <laughs> and if you saw somebody do that, what would be the first thing going through your mind? That much water, too. You'd be like, no, nah, he, he can't be finna cook. Yeah, this he something wrong. He he may have, didn't know the instruction manual of barbecue or something. Maybe we need an orientation packet or something, a DVD to show him how to start a fire. <laughs> but he did that, and so I could just see we we Christians and church folk think that. Just imagine what the unbelievers was thinking. He doing? We got this in the bag. <laughs> so he said. Do it a second time. Two times? And they did it, and he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time, put more water on there. Psh, by that time, I'm going to pack a saddle over there, going to get my cue, because I know this, this fire ain't finna go. I'm finna go on down in the bodacious and be, uh, pit barbecue and get me some, because I know this ain't gonna light up. He said, and the water ran around 
about the altar and he filled the trench also with water and put water around the trench. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Killed all 450 false prophets. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Let me go through this one more time. They repaired the altar. Things were set up in order. Then Elijah said, I did everything at your word, God. Then God said, okay, move out the way. Because you showed me that faith without works is dead and you worked this faith. And it was all about anytime you have a ministry or anything inside of you about restoration and restoring other people, there's an order God wants you to do. And the reason he wanted you to do it like that is because he wants you to take care of yourself as well. Get yourself and get your house in order so the enemy don't try to come play you. And so as you got, God has you already covered for what he's gonna do. And when he done that, it said it licked up the, it licked up the wood, the stones and the dust and licked up the water. <laughs> that was in the trench. So right here, when I get out of this, and they, then they slew all of them. But he had to do the thing in order. What order is God is showing me about some of my relatives and stuff out there that might be doing stuff? Because if they, the Bible said, train a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they should not depart from it. So what order is restoration of God is showing me that I need to do in order to repair the altar? Because <laughs> Elijah had to repair the altar in order for God to be glorified through that altar. So right here, this was about being repaired, restored. And God got so much involved in about restoration. So even if I was to call this topic right here, the topic of this sermon would be reparation. Reparations, spiritual reparations. Spiritual reparations. Because God has so many people that need repairing. So many people up there at the deal last night got repaired, they got repaired. There was a lot of people that got, and there's a lot of people that still, not just that, God wants to repair everywhere. God don't care. He can, God, the Bible says he is the God of Israel that neither sleep nor slumber. He can save you at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he can send somebody a servant your way and give you good news in the wee hours of the night. We the one that sleep and slumber, not him. So all we have to do is trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct all of our paths. So many people out there need to be saved, people. So many people need to see the Jesus that we got. People ain't wanting to come to church no more. And you know what? I've accepted that. I'm not gonna sit up here and blame the devil. Because the majority of them people that ain't coming to church is because they will tell you in a minute. 
And, and in fact, put it like this here, the promoter up there, I asked her where her son was, and he said, I don't wanna go up there with all them fake people. <laughs> and he was, he's 14. So he already done been through some experiences in church, so I'm not gonna blame the devil and all that. They seen some bad fruit in church. Now, some of them scars is hard to mend up. That's why when you see people coming to church, they've been in a while, they give you that look. Deer in the headlights look when they come through the door. Because <laughs> the, the enemy got to get in their mind to go back to the time when they got betrayed and scarred or something happened. And then you got to win these people trust all the way over again. Do you know how, ugh, do y'all know how much of a task it is to win somebody trust that been hurt? Again. Sometimes it's almost impossible. With God, all things are possible. But it's going to take some work and some trudging and some prayer in order for it to. So, I'm going to get this altar call right here. I want to talk, I want this altar call to be for people that you know that need a repair in their heart. That they need to alter their heart repaired. Mmm. I can see out there right now. Y'all already got their names right there. <laughs> so come on up here and let's pray for these people to get their heart repaired because the manifest manifestation of God showed up in this Bible after that altar was repaired. And we're going to be doing this. We're going to be praying for a manifestation of God's power. Not just that they, that we just praying. No, nah, we coming to fight. We coming in there saying, devil, you ain't taking them. Devil, you gonna come up off their mind. Devil, you gonna get out of their health. Devil, you gonna come in there. In fact, I'm gonna admit to you, God, I have been kind of tired of praying for them. I've been kind of weary. I've been kind of, yeah, but you know what? I'm gonna rejuvenate this thing, and I'm gonna give it one last shot the same way Jesus said, cast your net on the other side, do it one more time. God said, I need you to do it one more time. It only took one time for him to do this right here. He didn't go and redo it three or four, five, six times. He did it one time because after our word and order and the intention was to repair the altar. Mm. 